Okay. There we go. All right, so I stopped my, well, I'd like to welcome everybody here um, to our Ranchers Thursday lunchtime series. Um, my name is Barry Whitworth and I am a veterinarian that works for the Cooperative Extension Service here with OSU. Um, I'm gonna be your moderator today, just a little housekeeping. Um, everybody will be muted. Uh, we will take questions at the end of Dr. Gillen's presentation. If you wanna put those in the uh, chat box or Q&A, we'll look at those afterwards. Um, in order to get on with the program, I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, Gillum. He is a clinical associate professor of food and production medicine and field services at Oklahoma State University uh, Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital. Originally, he is from uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. He completed his DVM from Oklahoma State in 2001. He then practiced in a mixed animal practice in Dalhart, Texas for two years before returning to Oklahoma State University in 2003 to pursue a residency in food animal internal medicine. He completed a master's uh, science in veterinary medical science and became a diplomat of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners Food Animal in 2006. He served as a lecturer in food animal medicine from 2006 to 2009 and became a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine in 2008. He became a clinical assistant professor in 2009 and was promoted to clinical associate professor in 2016. His primary interest, professional interests include beef cattle production medicine, internal medicine, bovine thorough genealogy. His primary research interests include welfare production livestock and humane euthanasia. Uh, with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Gillum. Thank you, Dr. Whitworth. I appreciate the, inv the uh, uh, introduction and I appreciate the opportunity to be here this afternoon um, to visit with everyone. Um, like Dr. Whitworth said, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to share those um, via the chat or the Q&A section and we'll try to get all those covered at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here, see if I can get this to work. And, uh, somebody give me confirmation whether you can see that or not. Make sure that show working. Out. Okay, good deal. All right, let me get into presentation mode here. All right, so the, the topic for today was just kind of parasite control, and I kind of expanded that to include sort of a look at um, how we might think about the sustainability of gastrointestinal parasite control in cattle um, going forward. We all know if you have any involvement with the sheep and goat um, world that uh, there's significant concerns and significant difficulty in that area with um, anthelmintic resistance and um, running out of effective medications to control GI parasites in, in sheep and goats. And, and so um, we're not there with cattle, but I thought we would look at um, some some thoughts about how we might try to preserve um, and, and increase the sustainability of parasite control in cattle going forward so maybe we can avoid getting to the place where the sheep and goat industry is at this point. So that's kind of the overall goal for today. I um, thought we'd start out just by kind of doing a quick review of parasite life cycle. It's helpful to um, have a basic understanding of this life cycle um, when we start thinking about strategic deworming programs and, and when to deworm, when not to deworm and such. Um, if we um, under, have a basic understanding of the parasite life cycle, it makes those things make a little bit more sense. So, so um, hopefully this won't be too boring, but we'll kind of go through pretty quickly. But the, so the, the, we all know that, that um, the worms are in the animal. Uh, they produce eggs that are passed in the feces out onto the pasture. And then those eggs hatch and they go through a series of developmental stages on the pasture um, until they get to what we call an L3 stage. And that's the stage that is, is actually infective to the grazing animals when they're consuming the forage. They pick up these little microscopic parasites um, as they're grazing. And then those um, larvae go through a couple of more stages in the animal until they become a mature adult. And then that's those mature adults that are the ones that are actually producing the eggs uh, and causing the clinical effects in the animal as well. 
Um, some of those infective larvae, though, can actually cause clinical impacts in, uh, either on production or in some, some cases clinical disease um, even before they reach adulthood. So they don't have to get to the adult stage to, call, to have an impact on the animal, but we don't see any eggs produced and shed in the animal's feces until they do reach that adult stage. So um, because they are shed on the pasture and, and they have to hatch and go through some developmental stages, um, the pasture environment is a very important part of their life cycle. And so having the right temperature, being warm, um, having moisture, those are all critical for completion of the life cycle of parasite in, in order for those larvae to hatch, develop to the infective L3 stage, and then be consumed on the pasture. Um, they certainly are, are impacted by um, harsh environments on the pasture. So if it's particularly dry, particularly hot, or particularly cold, um, that can certainly reduce the number of infective larvae that are, that are on the pasture uh, out there for the animals to pick up. So this just kind of shows that same life cycle in just a pictorial form. Um, we've got our friendly cow here grazing along. Uh, she picks up some microscopic parasites, some L3 larvae. Um, those mature within the animal, um, begin produce, as they reach adulthood, they begin to produce eggs. Those are shed out in the feces. And then those eggs hatch in the, on, in the feces on the pasture and go through those developmental stages on the pasture until they reach the L3 stage. And that's where they become infective to the cattle as they're, as they're grazing. And those little critters are usually um, in, a, in a moisture droplet on the, on the forage. And as the animal grazes, they're, they're consumed along with the grass. So we also have this idea of the, of the pre-patent period. So remember I said they're, they're ingested as L3 larvae, but they don't produce eggs until they reach adulthood. Um, and so there's a lag between when those worms are ingested and when we start seeing eggs shed in the feces. And that's what we call a pre-patent period. And, and that period of time varies depending on the parasite. It also varies depending on the age of the host animal. Um, so that period is typically about four to six weeks in adult cattle, because adult cattle do tend to develop um, resistance and some immunity to the parasites. And so they, with the immune suppression that the, anim that the adult animals have, it takes longer for the parasites to complete the life cycle. Whereas in young animals, that can occur a little more quickly uh, because um, those animals don't have any developed immunity. And so about three to four weeks is when we start to see um, eggs being shed in the feces. So if an animal didn't have any parasites at all, and they went out and started grazing in a, in a contaminated pasture, um, it would take three to four weeks in a young animal before we were able to start detecting parasite eggs being shed in the fecal material of that, of that animal. So when we think about developing our strategic deworming strategies, um, we also need to think about you know, what is this pre-patent period. We may add that on to um, our deworming interval. It may impact um, which products we choose to use at what time and stuff. So, um, so it's important to keep this idea of the pre-patent period in mind. So here I just want to list and show you kind of the, what are the common um, nematode parasites of cattle. Um, these are not, this is not an extensive list by any means, but these are the more common ones and the ones that have the most significant impact in terms of, of production loss and or clinical disease. And, and fortunately, we don't see a lot of clinical disease from parasitism in cattle um, like we do in sheep and goats, but we do see um, in particular classes of cattle significant uh, production losses in some cases. But um, Ostertagia is, is the, called the brown stomach worm. These are the most, the most common and most significant economically uh, parasite of cattle. Um, so it's the most important one on the list when we're talking about cattle. The homonchus, um, there's homonchus placei there. There's, there's some other species of homonchus that can also uh, impact cattle. And, and those are blood feeding parasites. And so homonchus is also the, the primary um, parasite that's of most concern in the sheep and goat um, animals. So uh, it is a blood sucking animal, a uh, blood sucking parasite, blood feeding parasite. And so that's why we see such severe anemia and even sometimes death from anemia in our sheep and goats because again, homonchus is the primary parasite there. And, it, and it's not the primary parasite in cattle, but it can have a significant impact. And then there's the cuperia organisms that are um, a couple of different species there. Though Those can be quite significant. Um, they can be a real challenge, uh, particularly in young calves. Um, as animals age, they tend to develop immunity to cuperia, so we don't see a lot of cuperia in older cattle, but in young animals, they can be a very significant component of the parasite load. Um, and those three organisms together, or those three groups of parasites together, 
often get kind of grouped into what we call trichostrongyles. So when, when we do a fecal exam, or when you take the fecal exam to your veterinarian um, to see what the, what the parasite load in those animals is, um, we're gonna say, okay, we have X number of trichostrongyle eggs. And that's because we can't visually look at these eggs from these species and differentiate them. Um, they all look pretty much the same. And so in order to differentiate them, we have to um, go through a process of hatching those eggs and then identifying the larva, uh, which is a pretty laborious process. So in, in most routine fecal exams that we're gonna do, or you're gonna have your veterinarian do, um, we're gonna call these all trichostrongyles. And, and these three primary parasites all fall in that category. There's a couple others that are on the list that are, that are less significant in most cases, um, can become significant in some circumstances, but overall, it's those top three listed there that are most important and most significant. Just wanna quickly review what we have available on the market for um, anthelmintic products at this point in time. Um, there haven't been any new products introduced um, any time in the last oh, many years. And as far as I'm aware, there are none um, coming down the pipe, so to speak, in terms of any new products coming on the market anytime soon. So, so these are what we've got to work with. And so that's why I think, you know, taking some steps and, and processes to preserve their efficacy is really important. And so we've got the, the white wormers, the drenches, um, the finbendazole, albendazole, and, and then there's oxfendazole, which is not used as commonly, but, but you're probably all familiar with Safeguard and Panicure um, products that are pretty commonly used. And these are, are um, oral drenches in most cases. Safeguard comes in a variety of other forms as well, but the oral drench, the liquid, is the most commonly used form. Um, very broad spectrum, uh, very um, usually typically very effective anthelmintics. One thing to remember about these is they don't have any residual period. So we dose the animal, uh, the um, drug is active when we dose it, but it doesn't stay around and have any prolonged effect from uh, after, after the dosing. So we impact the parasites that are there on the day of deworming, but we don't have any impact on any parasites that might go out and graze and pick up tomorrow. Um, the next group is the macrocystic lactones. That's, that's the group that everybody's probably most familiar with. That's ivermectin, all the different ivermectin type products. Um, we've got avermectins in there and then also milbomycin, which is moxidectin, but they're all in the same category, have similar mechanisms of action. And of course, ivermec is the original one. Um, there's a variety of generics now on the market um, for, uh, that, are, that contain ivermectin. Um, and you're all probably familiar with, with Dectamax. Um, and then there's a Prinomec, then there's, all, there's the Prinomex product and also the long range product. That's the more, probably the more recent version of, of that product. And then Cydectin's the purple um, poron that everybody's real familiar with. So uh, those are very common. Um, these, this class of dewormers has a variety, has variable residual activity um, depending on the product and depending on the specific parasite. And I'll show you some data on that here on the next slide. Then the last class is, is Lovamisol. It's, it's um, a product that's not used commonly in cattle at all. If you do any, have any familiarity with sheep and goats or, or any of you are sheep and goat producers, you're probably more familiar with that because in many circumstances, um, we find ourselves that where Lovamisol is the only effective product left. And because it is a very older product, uh, it hasn't been used a lot in the last few decades. And so our current parasite populations haven't seen it much before. And so there's not much resistance to it when we have a lot of resistance to the, to the other classes. Um, so it's out there, it is available for use in cattle as well. It has to be mixed up and given as an oral drench. So the, the um, convenience of that product is significantly less than the other products that we've mentioned already. But, but it's out there and it may be one that may become a useful tool um, as we start to see more resistance um, in cattle if we, if we end up seeing that. So I mentioned that the, the um, Macrocyclic macro lactones have variable residual activity um, depending on the parasite. And so you can see in this table that that ranges from anywhere from, for, for most products, anywhere from 14 to 28 days, depending on the specific parasite. Um, the aprinomectin product, um, the long range aprinomectin product has a, a much longer um, residual activity out to 120 days um, based on the product label. But the others vary from anywhere from 14 to 28 days, depending on um, the product and the specific parasite. So that can be useful. And so what that means is that we deworm an animal today. And if we're talking about um, Dormectin, for example, Dectamax, um, then we can, any, any parasites that are picked up or any um, Ostertagia that's picked up as that animal goes out and grazes in the next three weeks, um, that drug is still there, still active, and it'll, it'll impact those parasite populations. 
Um, whereas if we use something like a safeguard or panicure, we don't get that residual impact. So that was just a quick review of, of parasites that, are, that we're concerned about and what products we have available to try to combat them. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about um, the concern about resistance and kind of go and show you um, some data that kind of shows where we are with that current concern with cattle. So what we do know is that, that no anthelmintic is 100% effective. Um, when we give a, a drug to an animal, we, don't, we never kill every parasite in that animal, unfortunately. Um, in many cases, those that do survive do so because they're carrying genes that make them resistant to that particular drug. Um, so they have um, gone through just by chance um, and through mutations in their, in their genetics and have developed mechanisms to resist the activity of, of those products. And then as we imply, uh, apply those products over time in populations of animals, um, we actually select those parasite populations for resistance because we kill all the ones or the majority of the ones that don't have the resistant genes and so the ones that are left are all the ones that carry those resistant genes and, and over time they become a bigger and bigger part of the, the parasite population um, if we keep applying that selection pressure and so that's how we get to the point of having resistance and that's how we've gotten there with the sheep and goats um, fortunately uh, for cattle producers the, the, the parasites in sheep and goats are slower to develop that resistance than, than the sheep and goat parasites so we're not at the same point but we do have some of the same issues uh, and we're starting to see more of those. So that's kind of what I wanna show you here in the next few slides is what is some of the evidence that's out there for uh, resistance in cattle and we'll kind of see, uh, see what we have available to look at. Just gonna show you a couple of studies and, and all I've got here are just the tables of, of, of the primary results from those studies. If you have a particular interest in a particular study and want to know how it was done or what more detail, um, I can share those with you afterwards. I have all these studies that we can go back and refer to, but there are a lot of detail. And so for the sake of time, I didn't put a ton of detail on here, but, but if you're interested in that, I'm happy to share that with you. But um, this, this study um, was conducted in, actually in Wisconsin, but it was done using um, stalker calves that originated in the southeastern part of the U.S. And so this particular producer um, had received stalker calves out of the U.S. for many years, out of the southeastern U.S. for many years, um, with no problems, and then all of a sudden one year, um, their management was all the same, their deworming protocol did not change, but they had clinical disease um, attributed to parasitism in, in some calves. And as they started doing some investigation, they figured out that uh, those calves were indeed parasitized, and um, then that led them to do a trial to see why their deworming program all of a sudden seemed to stop working when it had worked for 15 years or something like that. And so the following year, they conducted this trial, and, and what they did is they got calves out of the southeast, um, brought them to Wisconsin, and then performed these, these deworming trials with them. And so we can see that they, they compared a whole variety of products. You can see in that letter, the left-hand column. And then um, one thing I didn't mention before, uh, that when, when we're measuring anthelmintic efficacy, um, the goal is to see a 90% reduction in egg counts after deworming. So we, we measure egg counts before we deworm and then we measure egg counts two to three weeks after we deworm and we want to see at least a 90% reduction in those egg counts. Um, and, and that tells that we've good, got good efficacy. Um, that used to be 95% and now most um, recommendations have dropped down to 90% to kind of be the cutoff to say that we've got um, good efficacy of the, the product. And obviously that's a continuum. You know, if you're 88%, uh, you're still in reasonably good shape, but but 90% is that where it becomes a concern if we fall below that 90% threshold. And so you can see there in that far right-hand column that um, none of the products um, in this particular study, uh, in these particular calves, met that 90% reduction in, in fecal egg counts. Uh, and so there's evidence there of, of some resistance to, to um, all classes of dewormer, except for the levamisol that was not included in this particular study. So that, that's kind of initially a concern, um, raises some concerns that, and these calves were, were auction market calves out of the Southeast and they had been dewormed a couple of different times um, in management in Wisconsin and, and were part of the study. This study is by the same group of researchers. It's a follow-up study to the previous one. So it was conducted the next year. Um, so they did the same thing, got more same calves, or not the same calves, but calves from the same marketing channels out of the Southeast, um, brought them to Wisconsin and performed the study. And 
And this time they included the levamisole. They included it um, on its own and also in combination with apronomectin. And then they also um, did a, another, a couple of other groups that were combination um, products. And we'll talk some more about combination therapy here later on in the, in the presentation. But you can see there in the right-hand column that the levamisole did really well, um, near complete control. Um, but the other products didn't, the other products struggled. Uh, and so that's consistent two years in a row now where they've been able to demonstrate in, in similar calves coming from a similar environment um, where there is evidence of, of resistance to multiple classes and multiple products of dewormers. This study is, is goes the other direction on the other coast and these were actually cattle that came out of California. These were heifers that were feeder heifers that came from California. The study was actually done in Idaho. These heifers came from a ranch in, in um, California and, and where they had used um, uh, an avermectin dewormer for uh, four or five years at least. And then these cattle were moved to Idaho into a feed yard and that's where this deworming trial was conducted um, in a feed yard in Idaho. And so this is the, the numbers in the table show you the, the percent reduction um, over a variety of parasites there. And so we can see, if we look at the first column, this is the percent reduction of ostratagia. And we can see that, that um, uh, ivermectin struggled a little bit. It wasn't bad, it was almost 90%, but, but struggled a little bit. But if we look over at Cuperia, um, we can see that struggle becomes much greater, where ivermectin really, strugg ivermectin really struggled against Cuperia. Moxidectin fell below that 90% mark. And in this particular study, the, the finbendazole and oxfindazole, that benzimidazole class of dewormer, or the, the white wormers, performed pretty well. Uh, but ivermectin struggled quite a bit in this particular study. Uh, and, and that makes sense because, you know, everyone's used ivermectin for a lot of years because it's convenient. It was super effective when it first came on the market. Um, but we are seeing um, evidence of resistance to it as um, it's used more and more over, over several decades. And the last one study that I'll, that I'll um, show you here is, is by the same research group we saw before, but um, this is actually data that came from the 2007-2008 NOMS beef cow, beef cow calf study, if you're familiar with that study at all. And what they did is they gave producers an opportunity to send in fecal samples um, and then they, before they dewormed calves, and then they sent in fecal samples again um, after they dewormed calves and measured for resistance, looking for resistance. And so they got fecal samples from all over the country sent to them for this particular study. Now there's some limitations to this study because they didn't require that the producers sample the same calves um, each time. So that's, that's a big limitation. But it, it does show that there's at least a concern that, that resistance is out there. Um, and it's out there in a pretty wide geographic area. Um, there's still questions about how widespread it is and how big of an area, a big concern it might be in a particular area, but uh, it shows that there is resistance out there. And so if we look at the Southeast group, uh, that's where Oklahoma falls, we fall into that group. Well, there were only four producers in Oklahoma that participated and half of those producers had evidence of resistance based on the methodology used in this study. Um, and if we look at um, the states around us, um, Texas had, um, only had one herd, but it had evidence of resistance. And so the percentages here on the far right-hand column show you what percentage of operations or producers in each given region had evidence of resistance. And so in the Southeast, a third of producers had evidence of resistance. In the central um, area, you can see the states here, um, over half had evidence of resistance. And then just below a third in the West, from the Western states. So. So there's evidence that resistance is out there and it's becoming probably a bigger concern, um, something we need to pay attention to. So how do you know, as a, as a beef producer, how do you know if your anthelmintic is working or not? Um, and so what we do know based on, on those studies and some others that resistance is out there and it, and it appears to be increasing to some degree. So we can no longer just assume that our anthelmintic strategy is effective. And that's what we've done for many decades is we're gonna go out and, and give some dewormer whether that's an injectable product or an oral product or a pour-on product, and just assume that it works, right? We don't see cows don't we don't see sick cows. We don't see cows with clinical evidence of parasitism, so the dewormer must be working. Um, but we can no longer assume that because um, of this growing evidence of resistance. And so the only way to know uh, 
um, if our dewormer is working. And the only way to monitor to know if we are seeing resistance beginning to develop in our cattle populations or our parasite populations is to test for it. Uh, and, and there's some challenges with doing that. And so we've got a couple of options. The most accurate is to do a, a post-mortem worm count where we sacrifice an animal, um, necrops that animal, and some poor soul has to go through the GI tract of the animal and count the parasites that are there. Um, if you become a graduate student to do parasite work, you'll get to do that opportunity. That's a research tool that you use, but obviously not very practical in a real life setting. So that leaves us with what we call a fecal egg count reduction test. And that's kind of what we've looked at and kind of talked a little bit about in those previous studies where we, we take a fecal sample, we count the parasite eggs that are there um, per gram of, of fecal material. Uh, we deworm those animals and we wait two or three weeks and we get another fecal sample from those same animals and then count the eggs in that sample and look at the percent reduction. And again, we're wanting to see 90% um, reduction or more um, in order to, to be comfortable that there's no, no significant resistance in that parasite population. So if you're going to do this at a herd level, um, what's recommended is to do somewhere around 20 samples. Um, and if you've got less than 20 calves and you just sample them all. Um, because there is a significant variation in egg shedding in individual animals. So it's difficult. We can't just go out and do two animals in a herd and, and base a herd recommendation off of those two animals because there's so much individual animal variability. So somewhere around 20 samples is what's recommended. Um, and again, we want to see greater than 90% reduction um, in order to be comfortable if there's no, no significant level of resistance there. So there are some limitations. It's not a perfect system by any means. Uh, again, that individual variability is a significant, very, uh, significant limitation. Um, obviously sampling collection, sample handling, laboratory procedures all have the opportunity to introduce um, variability in the results. We do have some of, the, some of the products can actually suppress egg production without killing the worms. So it may slow down egg production, um, but the parasites remain alive in the animal and presumably could recover um, and produce, start producing eggs again at some point. Um, we don't have, like I said before, we can't tell what species of parasite is present. So if we're just doing a fecal egg count reduction test, we don't know if we're dealing with Ostertagia or if we're dealing with Cuperia or if we're dealing with a homonchus situation um, because all the eggs look the same. So we have to go through another process to be able to tell which species is present um, in those cases. And it's cost and labor intensive. It, it takes a lot of work to go out and collect those fecal samples. Maybe getting the first ones is not that much work if you're already processing your calves, but then you got to go back and handle those calves again and get another sample in two to three weeks. Uh, and then we've got to pay for the, all those samples to be processed. And um, we've got to have your, either take them to your veterinarian. Most veterinarians can do these fecal egg count reduction tests in, in their clinic. Um, you can also send those to a diagnostic lab and get the results back. But there's certainly costs associated with that. Uh, and again, we need to, to have a statistically valid sample, we need to use, do somewhere around 20 animals. And so there, that cost can be you know, relatively substantial. Um, and it's not something that you'd have to do every year, but it's something that, that ought to be done probably every few years um, to really kind of monitor efficacy of our anthelmintic program. So even though there are some limitations with the fecal egg count reduction test, uh, it's still kind of currently our, our most practical method to assess efficacy. It's not perfect by any means, but it's, it's the most practical method that we have currently. Um, this study that I'll show you here is, is encouraging because what they looked at in this study is, is um, can we do pooling? So, so if we're just trying to assess the occurrence of resistance at the herd level, and we're not really trying to figure out within an individual animal, and we just want to know, do the parasites in this, in this population or this herd have any evidence of resistance? Can we pool those samples together and reduce the sampling cost? We still have to sample the individual animals, but can we reduce the sampling, or the, the testing cost by pooling those? And so what they did is they, they collected samples, ran those all individually, did individual fecal egg count reduction tests. And then in the lab, they pooled those fecal samples together, um, anywhere from, from nine to about 15 animals in a pool and then reran those to see if there was agreement between the pooled samples and the individual samples. And, and overall, it worked pretty well. So for, um, for testing, just for resistance at the herd level, um, pooling samples um, is, is encouraging and, and may be an opportunity to reduce some of that cost. Uh, and it, it had a significant reduction in cost. So just, just by pooling those samples, they reduced um, cost, um, the actual testing by, 
by almost 80%. And so it's gonna save a lot of investment in terms of the testing cost. This is the only paper that's done that. Um, it's a new thing. So before I would recommend that widely, I'd like to see it repeated. And, and we're actually in the middle currently of doing a survey of anthelmintic efficacy in, in Oklahoma beef cattle herds. We're collecting samples right now. Actually, I collected some samples this morning as part of the study. And one of the things that we're going to do in that is we're going to try to repeat this pooling process to see if, if we can get the same results. And so we're going to do individual um, reduction tests and then we're going to um, pool those samples and, and compare them to see if, if we can get similar results to this paper. And, it, and if we do, then that'll be pretty encouraging that this might be a way to um, effectively monitor for resistance in our beef cattle herds um, without having to incur such substantial cost of doing it on individual animals. So what do we do about it? We know there's resistance out there. Um, there's concern that it's becoming more common. Um, we don't have any new products on the market or anything coming you know, on the market anytime soon to kind of save us from this concern of resistance. Um, so what do we do um, to try to prevent that? And so there's several things that we can consider. Um, the first is this concept of refugia. And that's um, basically what that means is, is we don't treat all the parasites. And so we're not applying that selection pressure of treatment to all of the parasites in the population. And we do that by leaving some animals untreated. Uh, the question is who and how do we decide who to leave untreated? So if you see the little picture on the far right there, those are a, a little sheet of um, eyes of goats and showing the different mucous membrane color. Um, that's how we do it in sheep and goats. It's called the FAMANCHA scoring system um, because the primary parasite is homonchus. It's a blood feeding parasite. And so the biggest issue we have in those animals is anemia and blood loss. And so that becomes pretty easy to detect just by looking at their mucous membrane color. And if they're pale or white, then we know they're heavily parasitized and need to be treated. If they're nice and pink, um, then we don't treat them. And then whatever parasites they do have aren't being selected for resistance. And so they um, can contribute to the overall parasite population on the pasture, uh, trying to keep those resistance genes more diluted out in, that made in the parasite population on the pasture. Um, that's more challenging to, do, challenging to do in cattle because we don't have a good way to detect which animals are heavily parasitized and which ones aren't just by looking at them. Because again, we aren't seeing anemia because that's not the primary parasite. And we just, it's hard to look at a, in an animal and say, yeah, that one's heavily parasitized and, and this one's not. Uh, we do know that there are significant differences in, in the level of parasites within individual animals. Uh, and there's um, evidence that about 80% of the parasites live in about 20% of the animals. Um, so we do know that there are, are variances there, but it's hard to figure out who, the, who those are, who are those animals that are carrying most of the parasites. And so there's several studies that have looked at different ways to do targeted selective treatment, and they've looked at things like um, doing fecal egg counts on calves, and then only going back and deworming the ones that have high fecal egg counts. That's a good method, but obviously very labor intensive and expensive because we got to do a fecal egg count on every calf. Um, there are studies that have looked at um, monitoring growth um, and treating ones that fall below uh, average daily gain threshold. Uh, but that requires having weights and being able to weigh calves and being able to um, look at those average daily gains. And it requires running them through a chute to get a weight and then running them back through a chute to deworm the ones that need it. And so there's a lot of handling there. And so um, a lot of those studies are done in Europe where their production system is quite a bit different. And they're pretty challenging in my mind to apply to many of our beef production systems here in the U.S. because many of our, our systems are so much more extensive and we're just not handling those animals as frequently um, as they maybe are in some other types of beef production systems. So one idea that, that I think might be useful is, is maybe um, to use the adult beef cows as a source of refugia. So um, we don't see typically clinical disease in adult cattle um, from parasites, again, because they do develop some resistance. Uh, some Im immunity to them. Um, so maybe we don't deworm those adult cows and we leave them as a source of refuge and we deworm the younger animals. There's, there's lots of evidence in the published literature that um, deworming young animals improves growth, improves performance. Um, it becomes a little more questionable when we look at the value of deworming adult cattle. Um, I'm not super comfortable saying don't deworm your adult cows at this point because there are studies that show an increase in milk production or an increase in calf weight when the cow is dewormed, presumed to be from an increase in milk production. Um, there are some studies that show benefits to reproductive efficiency 
Um, but then there are other studies that don't show any benefit at all. So the answer is real, not real clear um, for our adult beef cows. Um, I think a good option might be, you know, to do some fecal egg counts on some adult cows and kind of see what their level of parasitism is. And if it's pretty low, then maybe we can be pretty safe not deworming them. And so um, we don't have a real clear answer on that yet. Um, but I, I do have clients that, that don't deworm adult cows and, and I have a lot of clients that do. And I'm still just a little bit, um, a little bit nervous to say, hey, we just don't need to deworm these adults at all. Um, based on the available data. Um, I think that would probably work, but I, based on the available data, um, I think we need, we need to get some more data to be super comfortable using that as, as in saying for sure that we should, we should do that. But I think it's important to think about this idea of targeted selective treatment and how we might do that. Um, and we unfortunately don't have a real clear answer on the best way at this point in time, um, but we do know that the concept is important and the idea is important. And so particularly if you do identify some resistance in your in your herd through um, fecal egg count reduction testing then thinking about ways to implement this idea of refugia in your production system could be important um, another thing to consider is the idea of combination therapy and there's various studies that support that and we won't go through all those um, just so we don't bore you too much with those but but what the idea there is is that we use two dewormers at the same time um, from different classes so we use two dewormers that are from a different class that have different mechanisms of action and so we get a more effective kill on the parasites by doing that um, that's super common in sheep and goats now um, places in australia where they actually use three or four products at a time in order to get any kind of measurable efficacy in sheep and goats and so um, we don't want to get there with cattle but there is a lot of evidence that combination therapy uh, even in, in cattle um, does better than individual drug therapy when there is when resistance is present and so again, if you do some testing and you find that you do have some concerns about resistance in your cattle, then combination therapy would be something to consider as a way to help um, mitigate that uh, resistance. And it doesn't matter what the combination is, but it's important that it's different classes of drugs. So we wouldn't want to use Cydectin and Dectamax. That's not really combination therapy because they're same class, similar mechanisms of action. But we might want to use Maybe you want to use um, Safeguard and Aprinomectin or Safeguard and um, Cydectin, something like that. So we're actually using different classes of drugs um, and that improves the efficacy when there is resistance present. The other thing you want to think about is the, is the route of administration. Um, everybody loves the pour on dewormers. Um, they're super convenient, easy to use, um, but they are the most concerning in terms of um, leading to resistance because they they produce lower concentrations of drug at the parasite um, and they also produce more variable concentrations of drug at the parasite and both of those issues tend to select for resistance um, so there's there's significant evidence that the poron products the poron formulations have a higher risk of leading to resistance than either injectable products or the orally administered products um, the orally administered products are nice because the product goes exactly where the parasites are. It goes right into the GI tract where the parasites are. Um, so that's an advantage. The main disadvantage of those products, other than the hassle of administering them, is they don't have any residual activity. Uh, and so our injectable products provide some residual activity, but the product's not going right where the parasites are, but it does get there and, and they are typically effective. Um, the porons, they can be effective in some degrees, but they're, they're just um, less effective and higher risk of inducing or leading to resistance. Um, other concerns with porons are that, that animals may lick uh, them. Um, there's concern that that may, if an animal licks the poron off its neighbor, then its neighbor's not getting the right dose. It might actually help the one doing the licking because then it's, it's ingesting that drug orally, um, but then the animal that's being licked um, won't uh, get it, its um, correct amount of, of drug. And then some of those poron products are, are, weather, are not weather resistant, and so they get rained on, um, get washed off, et cetera. Um, the other thing we got to think about is, is accurately dosing our dewormers, um, regardless of whether we're using a poron or we're using an injectable or an oral product. Um, we don't want to ever dose them to the average size animal, because if we do that, that means we're dosing them, we're underdosing half the animals. And so then we're increasing the opportunity to, to select for resistance in those animals because we aren't delivering an adequate dose to their, to their parasites. Um, 
So just guessing at weights, um, you know, some people are better at that than others. Um, I'm not very good at it. And so if I have to estimate weights um, for dewormer application, I tend to estimate high. Um, I'd rather give too much than not enough. Um, that costs more, but from an efficacy standpoint and a drug resistance standpoint, it's better to give too much than not enough. So if you have the opportunity to, to dose weights or dose drugs based on actual weight, that's certainly preferable. Um, but if you're going to estimate weights, um, estimate high and dose off the um, larger end of the animals. Don't, don't dose to, to the average uh, because you're under dosing half the animals in that case. Some other things to think about um, are you know, cattle genetics. Um, there's evidence that, you know, we do know that, that Brahmin influenced cattle um, have increased parasite resistance over um, non-Brahmin animals. So that might be something to consider, maybe introducing some crossbreeding um, and bring in some parasite resistance from a genetic standpoint. Uh, there's some work being done looking at um, resistance of parasites, um, even within particular breeds, and can we select for parasite resistance? That's being done a lot in, in sheep and goats. Uh, and say, so, okay, can we can we select with even within a given breed? Can we find animals that are that have superior resistance, and can we use that as a selection criteria for um, improving the genetic genetic resistance of those animals? Um, grazing management is important, so these parasites stay. Um, in the lower kind of few inches of forage typically. And so if we avoid overgrazing where the cattle aren't grazing down close to the ground, we can reduce the number of parasites that are picking up off the pasture. Um, they don't like to eat next to the fecal pads. So, and, and those parasites don't travel very far from the fecal pads. And so if we, um, if we can avoid um, overgrazing so that cattle aren't forced to graze close to manure piles, um, they'll do better uh, in terms of picking up less parasites. Um, there is some work being done with vaccination. Um, nothing currently available on the market in the U.S., um, but there are a couple of products in, in Europe. Uh, and there's some work being done um, here as well, looking at the opportunity to increase that immune resistance. So can we use that as a way to maybe use less dewormer product by increasing the immunity of the animals? And, and maybe we'll get there at some point. We're not there yet in the U.S. in terms of commercially. Um, and then there's the idea of, of plants with anomalic properties, and that's being looked at in, in sheep and goats as well. Um, stuff like Charisha lespidiza and its ability to, um, it has some anthelminic properties um, and, and can have some impacts. Now, I would be really hard pressed to convince myself to recommend you plant Charisha lespidiza on purpose, um, but that stuff ranks right up there with, with cedar trees, um, eastern red cedar trees is trying as a plague to um, pasture management, but um, that may be something that ends up being more important in the, in the future. Um, so in just in a quick summary, um, we, can, we can no longer just assume that our traditional parasite control programs work. Um, we're, we're all probably guilty of just doing what we've always done and assuming that it's working um, because it used to work, so it should still work. And that's just not the case. There's significant evidence of resistance to all classes of anthelminics. Um, so it's not just one product or one class, it's been detected against all of them. Um, and again, we don't know how widespread it is based on the available literature, but we do know it's out there. Um, and we've seen it come from, it's been identified in animals from a variety of production systems and geographic locations. So it's not just a Southeastern US problem. Uh, it's been detected on the West Coast. There's evidence of, of herds in Oklahoma having resistance. So um, it's something we need to all think about and, and just no longer just assume that our control program is working. Um, we should, as veterinarians, we should be strongly encouraging our clients to begin monitoring the effectiveness of control programs. And again, that can only be done through um, monitoring and testing. And so um, if the pool testing does turn out to be reliable, then that's a good option, a less expensive option. Um, but it might still be worth, even, even without that, it might, it, it's probably worth doing some testing um, every few years just to monitor effectiveness of, of your program. And if you've been doing the same thing for a number of years um, without any testing to see if it's working, I'd really encourage you to consider, um, consider doing some testing just to make sure that your, your program is working and you're not leaving um, production on the table um, by having a less than, less than effective deworming program. We do need a good science-based uh, method of refugia for cattle. And again, we just don't have that at this point. We don't have enough data to really say what's the best opportunity to do that. 
but we do know from from experience with sheep and goats that that works. Um, the idea of, of keeping those resistance genes diluted in the population works, and we just need to figure out a, a, a practical and usable way to do that in cattle. And, and we have some options, um, but we just don't have a real clear answer on what's the best way to do that yet in cattle. Um, and, and we just need to be thinking about and be cognizant of the idea that, that we do have evidence of resistance to all of our current available products, and we need to be thinking about how to maintain their efficacy over the long term because there's no no evidence of anything new coming on the market anytime soon so we can't rely on that to to pull us out of the situation so we need to be thinking about the sustainability of our current products and how we might keep them functional for a longer period of time dr whitworth that's it that's all i got um i hope time's okay um and i'm happy to try to answer any questions that anybody might have if there's questions in the chat or, or q a yes thank you dr gillum um we have several questions, um, and I think the most of the first ones here are all going to be related to the study um, that was done on the resistance. I think the Gasper uh, studies, and you may or may not be able to answer these. Um, they wanted one of the question was was uh, Ipronex or long range used in any of those studies. I don't know if that was specified in there i doubt long range because i don't think long range was out back they, these were 2000. done before long range was available yeah, yeah they were um, i'm going to look back through here and see so the the second one the the follow-up study that was done did use a printomectin okay. but it was the epronex the printomectin because these were done before long range was on the market that's what i was thinking yeah um uh, also uh related uh was the, was it Ivamec or generic Ivamec? Do you know that question? Um, I I would have to go back and look for sure, but um, pretty certain these were were Ivamec. Yeah. They were the product, right. the original the original product. Yeah. Now I know that National Animal Health Monitoring, where they just that was just the owners, whatever they used, wasn't it? They didn't right. have in, in that study in the in the NOMS study, um, in the, it was the 2015 study that I showed. They didn't change anything about management of the operation. They just um, recruited producers to um, do what they've always done, but collect a sample before and collect a sample afterwards. Uh, and so, and, and that's pretty similar to this little trial that we're in the middle of right now is we're not, we're not changing anything about management of the cattle to what's being done. We're just trying to measure how well what people are doing currently is actually working um, just to see if, if we have, evidence of resistance in our Oklahoma cattle population. So um, taking that same idea and just making it specific to Oklahoma. But yeah, you're right. Those, they, they didn't um, specify anything about dewormer there. And again, that in that particular study, they didn't even require, they, they sampled the same animals, uh, which is, is a little bit problematic just because we know there's so much individual animal variability in egg shedding. Uh, so, so we are, in our project, we are sampling the same animals each time. Um, but we're just we're allowing producers just to continue to do what they've always done and we're just going to measure the efficacy of it. You mentioned something there uh, which was kind of relates to another question about uh, was asked does the immune system of mature cows control parasite egg shedding or uh, and do low egg counts always correlate with low parasitism in the animal? Uh, yeah um, we know we do know that adult cows tend to have lower parasite egg counts um, in general, and that's we think that's again because of immunity, um, and that is when we, if we do worm counts in them, they also have lower parasite counts, and so it's not just that the cows have a bunch of parasites and the and the um, immunity is suppressing egg production; they're actually less susceptible to the parasites, so they 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 have less parasitism in general, uh, and that's part of the reason why we don't see um, near as much loss in production or, or clinical disease in adult cattle from parasitism. It's, you know, far more common to see that in young animals. Um, and that's also part of the reason why we think maybe those adult cows might be a good source of refugia because the impacts of the parasites are reduced are less on them because they have that immunity. And so maybe we can use them to our advantage in that sense. But yeah, it's, it's um, they have lower overall parasite burdens and that equates to um, lower egg production. A uh, question about collecting fecals. Uh, should it be done rectally or can you 
take samples off the ground? What's um, to be most accurate, you would want to take them off from the animal. You'd want to get those samples from the animal. Now, if you are watching the animal and you see it defecate and you go over and pick up a sample off the top of that pile without getting any soil contamination or forage contamination in that sample, that's probably okay. But if you get them off the pasture, what you risk is you, you risk your sampling the pasture and not the, not, not the animal. And then when you get that second sample later on, um, you may not get the same representative sample. So it's best to get them directly from the animal um, so we, we do those with just a rectal sleeve and, and just grab a handful um, and, and put that in a container. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it needs to be, it, ideally it's done from the animal unless you actually are able to see it defecating over it and make sure you get a sample from the top without getting any dirt or, or forage contamination because that may alter the egg counts in that, in that sample. Um, another question was uh, as far as uh, X per gram, the fecal egg counts, uh, is there a particular number that is economically important as far as in cattle? Or, uh, That's a cow? great question. Um, so so if I understand your question correctly, it, it's what level of parasite eggs do we need to see to be concerned about, right? right. Uh, when does it become a concern? And I don't think that's real well defined. Um, just talking yesterday with our parasitologist here at our diagnostic lab, and, and she said for fecal egg count reduction tests to be meaningful, um, they like to see at least 100 eggs per gram on those animals. And so if we're getting back very low counts, one, we probably don't need to deworm those animals if, we, you know, if we're getting samples before we deworm them. But two, when we're doing a reduction test, if our counts are very low, um, it, it because then just a few percentage points or you know a, a, a small change in egg counts changes the percentages a lot um, it makes them harder to interpret those and so we don't have a great I, as far as I know there's not a, a magic number that says okay above this level it's significant and below this level is not um, but in, our, in terms of getting an accurate reduction test we'd like there to be you know somewhere above 100 eggs per gram Cattle tend to be pretty low shedders. And so if, if, if someone's used to looking at egg counts on sheep and goats, you'll look at cattle egg counts and think, oh man, these, these animals don't have any issue at all uh, because goats might be in the thousands um, and um, cattle are gonna be you know, in, the, in the hundreds. So a, a really bad egg count on a bovine is you know, anywhere in the hundreds um, because they're just, they just don't have as much egg shedding as the small ruminants do. Um, but you know, if, you, if you're getting samples back, so one of the uh, participating veterinarians in my study sent some samples in um, and the egg counts were, many were zero and some were in the, you know, around 20. Um, and we think, you know, well, man, if, if we had had those results back before we actually gave the dewormer, we might elected not to give any dewormer to those animals because they didn't really have enough egg count to, to make us feel like they needed it. But again, that's, we don't have, um, we don't have a, a, a hard and fast threshold to say above this is too much and above this is not, you know, significant. But um, if, if you're above 100, I'd be pretty confident saying um, there's, there's significant parasitism there. Um, below that, it becomes a little more gray. Okay. Um, and there was, um, I'll just read this question. How do you tell the difference between a dose limiting and a resistant parasite? Um, So if I think I understand that correctly, so do I know that uh, when we, if we see evidence of resistance, how do we know that it's because the parasites were res are actually resistant or that we just didn't give a high enough dose? Is that how you'd interpret that question? That's how I'm interpreting it. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. If, if you submitted that question and that's not what you intended, let us know and we'll try to answer the question that you wanted to ask. But um, so I think, that if if once if we if we see resistance in a fecal egg count reduction test, um, we don't know. Uh, but the way we do figure that out is is make sure we're given the appropriate dose at the time of dewormer. So if that's a concern, then we need to to weigh some animals and make sure we're giving the correct dose, giving an accurate dose. Um, you know, make sure we're not deworming cows in the in the corrals. They run by us. We're not squirting some poor on at them. You know. Um, makes it fast and easy, but, but not a very accurate way to deliver that drug. So um, that's a concern um, that 
giving a lower than effective dose is also a good way to select for resistance because you kill off the parasites that are wimpy and, and susceptible to the, to the drug, um, but you're gonna leave a higher percentage of them behind who are resistant. And so that's a good way to select for, um, select for resistance too. So, so getting the appropriate dose in them is really important. And like I said, if, if, we're, if you have to estimate weights, which I know a lot of people do, um, estimate high. Uh, these products are pretty safe. And so the risk of giving an overdose that's dangerous is relatively low. Um, you'd have to give a massive overdose to be much of a concern. Uh, so estimate high. Um, but if, if, you have, if you've measured and you've got resistance and you're worried that man, maybe it was because I didn't give enough, the only way to know that for sure is to um, repeat it and, and make sure you administer the right dose. And so you eliminate that variable. And then you can see if you have uh, what the response is then. Okay. Uh, one other question, how many times a year should we deworm and at what time of the year should we deworm? That's a good question. Um, I figured somebody's going to ask that question and, and that's a question that you really can't answer in this forum uh, because it depends on so many variables. And so what I'd tell you there is, is that's where you can really work with your, your local veterinarian, your local extension folks and and develop a plan that's specific for your location and your operation. So, um, you know, I've gotten some samples back for our study that came from out in the northwestern part of the state, um, and they didn't need to deworm those calves this particular year. And we've been talking with the veteran, I've been talking about why that might be, why those egg counts would have been unexpectedly low. And, and the idea was that, well, it was super dry. Their spring and early summer were super dry out there. And that has a big impact on parasite populations on the pasture. And so we think that maybe is part of it. Um, and so maybe it's a year to year thing and you say, okay, maybe we normally deworm X time of year, but if it's a really dry year, maybe we save that money and we don't need to deworm that particular time for those, those animals. So um, the general rec I mean, the historical recommendation has been to deworm, um, you know, four to six weeks after cattle start grazing green forage. Um, so sometime early summer, um, and then deworm again after, they're, after they've gone through a pre-patent period and whatever the residual period on the product that you used was. And so, you know, let's say, if, for example, if we use a product that has a month long with residual period um, and we're deworming adult cows, so we've got a four to six week pre-patent period, you know, somewhere we deworm early summer and then somewhere toward the end of the summer or early fall would be when we would do them again. Um, and the idea that they're, they're going to the fall not carrying a heavy parasite load. Um, but that varies a lot from year to year. Um, it varies a lot from setting, you know, if, if you are, um, if you're in, in a rotational intensive grazing system where you're grazing a lot of Bermuda grass and fescue, um, you probably have more of a parasite concern than somebody who's grazing tall grass native, native pasture all year, um, as long as that pasture is not significantly overgrown because those Cattle in that intensive grazing system are going to be grazing closer to the ground. Um, they're going to be grazing, you know, down closer where the parasites are in most cases. So, so there's no there's no one good answer to that. Unfortunately, um, I wish there was an easy way to say, okay, deworm in May and deworm in September, and and everybody's good. But it's just not that clean cut because there's so many variables that go into that answer. And so it really has to be. Uh, it's kind of like vaccination programs. It really has to be um, tailored to an individual operation. And then also based in many cases on on year to year variability, uh, and so if, if we deworm early summer and then the summer turns off to be one of those super hot, super dry summers that we get often, uh, man, we may not need to give a second dewormer in those years because the sun killed all the parasites on the pasture and the cows haven't picked up much else. Um, so it, it's pretty variable, and because of the impact of environmental factors on parasite populations, we really have to kind of consider that, you know, from a year to year basis. And so, um, you know, most of us fall into the trap of doing what we've always done and, and having on a program, but it, I think it makes sense to consider, um, you know, having a, a protocol, having a plan, but then being flexible in some years, maybe electing not to deworm um, when environmental conditions suggest that that might be a way to save some money. Uh, I'm going to hit one last question because I know we're coming up right at 1.30. Uh, there was a question about rotation, rotating warmers. Uh, can you make a comment on that? Yeah, um, 
you know, we used to think that that was that rotating classes of dewormers. So changing dewormers every year, changing classes every year was the way to avoid resistance. Um, and we've learned from experience with small ruminants, sheep and goats, that that doesn't really work. Um, that what that ends up doing is actually selecting for resistance to multiple different um, classes of drugs. And so in, in the sheep and goat world, what's recommended is, is to find a product that works, um, practice refugia, and use that product until it no longer works, and then switch to something else. Because if we, if we apply selection pressure to, um, to all of our drugs, then we've, we're actually selecting for resistance to all of those drugs. And so remember that parasite population on the pasture um, isn't, isn't a new and distinct population from year to year. Right, so those those eggs overwinter, some of the larvae overwinter on the pasture, and so if we apply selection pressure to some, you know, with product A this year and we switch to product B next year, now we're ending up with the population of parasites that actually has resistant genes to both. And over time, we can actually get multi-drug resistance in that scenario. So, so we tend to to move away from the rotational deworming and identify a product that works through through testing and stick with that until we have a reason to change. Well, I know we're right at 1.30 and I know people probably have other, if we haven't answered all your questions, uh, if you will send uh, your questions to me at barry.whitworth at okstate.edu, I will try to get those answered for you or you can send them also to Dr. Biggs at uh, her email address. I want to thank Dr. Gillum for a good, great presentation. I appreciate you taking the time to do that. i uh, also like to thank uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine and uh, Oklahoma State University Extension for uh, participating in this program. Uh, just like to let you know that Dr. Meredith Jones will be talking about lameness in cattle next Thursday. Look forward to her talk. Um, and as you leave, I believe, if not, it's in the chat box. We sh if you haven't already taken the integrated beef cattle survey, we really want cattle producers, veterinarians, and veterinary students to take that survey. So. Uh, if you haven't, please do that for us. We really would appreciate it. Uh, with that, um, Dr. Lawman, I think uh, we'll call this good for the day. So I thank everybody for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you all. Look forward to seeing you next week. Mm -hmm.